Hello and welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 3, the Advanced Certificate in Procurement and Supply Operations. This is Module 1, Procurement and Supply Environments and it's Learning Outcome 1, which is to know the different sectors of procurement and supply. So the way you approach procurement and supply will depend very much on the context in which it operates. So different approaches are needed according to the sector. So let's start with the private sector. The primary objective of a private sector organisation is to make a profit. And they're funded in a number of ways. It's a combination of investment, revenue and debt. And there are two main types of um, private sector companies. You're either incorporated or unincorporated. So incorporated companies are registered at company's house and they're considered to be a separate legal entity from their owners. That means that the owners are not responsible for any debt, unlike the unincorporated companies who have liabilities. So unincorporated companies have the advantage of being simple to set up and to administer. And they have very few regulations to adhere to. But the problem with them is that they're not separate legal entities. So the sole traders and partnerships can get into debt and the debt is then the responsibility of the individuals to pay. They're going to go through the unincorporated companies first and then I'll come back to the incorporated companies in a moment. So we're going to look at some of the sole trader characteristics first. These people are self-employed. The business is about them as the individual. They are not a separate legal entity. As I said earlier, if that individual gets into debt in their business, then they could be personally liable to pay that back. But they do have the exclusive ownership of the business and they can make all the decisions and they keep all of the income but they're responsible for the losses and any surplus profits are treated as income. So the business can be set up relatively easily. Few regulations need to be followed. Only really need a small amount of money to start the business unless expensive equipment is required. And it's easy to manage the business as everything is visible. So the owners can make really quick decisions. But the downside is it's very lonely for one person to take on the burden of running the business. You have to do the finance, the accounting, the IT problems, the selling, the doing. It's a lot of work for one person. And there's always that risk of unlimited liability with your personal assets being needed to cover any business debts. And it can be difficult to develop and grow the business as you're the only one in it. So a natural way to grow would be to form um, a partnership where two like-minded people come together or people that perhaps complement one another. Some examples might be lawyers and builders, accountants, architects, plumbers, training companies. And in terms of their characteristics, they're owned by two or more people, which means they can share resources such as money and skills. But the same applies to the sole traderships. They're not separate legal entities, but they have joint ownership of the business, having to share decisions as well as the profits and losses. And it's sometimes not seen as equal because you're not always involved in the management. You could be a silent partner, for example. But in terms of the profits, again, same applies. It's treated as income in the eyes of the tax man. There are sort of three broad level types of partnerships. The general partnership is where everyone shares legal and financial liabilities as well as the profits. And how this is done is set out in a partnership agreement. Liability is limited and all partners are jointly and severally liable. A limited liability partnership or LLP is most commonly used in professions like lawyers and architects and the liability of the individuals are limited. The partners can be equity partners or salaried partners. An equity partner, um, they own a share in the business and a share in the profits. So at the end of each year, they'll get something called dividends. Whereas a salaried partner will be paid a salary as well as a bonus. And the limited partnership is a hybrid of these two previous ones. 
um, there may be at least, or sorry, there must be at least one general partner who has full liability, but others can be silent partners and they don't necessarily participate in the management of the organisation. So the good and bad um, partnerships, I guess the more partnerships there are, the more set up capital is available. So if you are needing to buy expensive machinery, you've got more money coming in to start up, um, which means that it's a lower risk for each of the other people. But decision making is shared amongst the partners, which means that you might be able to sort of, I don't know, benefit from different people having different skills maybe somebody's good at selling somebody's good at doing someone's good at finance someone's good at uh, i don't know other stuff so you know the um the decision making and the different skills can be divided up accordingly the downsides though is different people have different ideas so there may be disagreements amongst the partners which is very disruptive and can be quite time consuming General partnerships have unlimited liability, but this can be mitigated by forming a limited liability partnership instead. And it is possible that some partners perceive that the other partner doesn't contribute equally, so believe they earn an unfair profit share. So those were unincorporated companies. We're now going to look at incorporated companies. Now, both of these raise capital through selling shares, but only public limited companies can have its shares traded on the stock exchange. Private companies can sell shares, but only with it with the consent of the owners, and it's often to friends and family. So the two types is your LTDs limited or your PLCs. So private limited companies, the company is owned and the ownership is apportioned through shares. And the liabilities of the holders of these shares is limited to the share value and the shares cannot be traded. PLCs, public limited companies, don't confuse this with being a public um, sector organisation because it's not, it's still private. But these are the ones that can float on the stock exchange, which is why they're known as a PLC. So liability of the holders of these shares is limited to the share value, but shares can be traded through the exchange. So essentially you and I, um, general public, can go in and buy shares of a PLC, but we can't do that with an LTD. One of the biggest reasons for a business to move from an unincorporated status to incorporated status is tax benefits, because you only pay tax on um, profit. And this is where the corporation tax applies when you're a sole trader or a partner the tax man sees all of that income as something they can tax you on so there's huge tax benefits so if you get to sort of a larger size organization it's so much better to be incorporated and you can um, offset some of your expenses as well as well as pension contributions some of the companies will um, offset pension fund contributions for their tax calculations and you increase your options to raising capital. If you remember um, when I said earlier about the sole traders and partners, it's hard for them to find money to start up. But because incorporated companies can sell shares, this brings um, money into the business quite easily. That gives them the opportunity to expand as well. But the downside is it's more costly to administer. The, you do need a written constitution. Um, and you have a, a requirement to submit regular paperwork on an annual basis, otherwise you'll get struck off. But because of these additional regulations, there's more controls in place, which makes it really difficult for the owners to withdraw money. Um, and another downside of being incorporated is the public um, details of the, per the people that own the businesses in the public domain. In terms of the size and scope in the private sector, you can be as small as a micro company up to a large multinational corporation. Micro companies um, have less than 10 employees and this has been, it used to be um, a term that we called an SME, but now we're looking at MSME because there's a recognition of these micro companies and I think a lot of it comes back to technology startups. But small is considered to be up to 50, medium up to 250. But if you if you employ more than 250 people, you're considered to be um, a large organisation. 
in terms of the challenges that um, some of the micro small and medium enterprises have is they do lack access to finance they don't necessarily have the management skills they're really good at what they do whatever their trade is but they don't necessarily know how to run a business they lack the resources and you've got the the burden of the regulatory requirements just going to go through some of the um, private sector definitions now if, if i can things that you might see um, quite often the first one is liabilities. This is a term um, that explains what a company owes to other people, whether it be debts, loans or suppliers or something like that. So liabilities is the amount a business owes, which is often measured against what a, a company owns, which is your assets. So it's the value of what you own versus what you owe. Profit is the amount left over after the company has paid its liabilities. And shares is a way that a business can apportion its ownership through dividends. Capital is the amount of money or assets available to be leveraged by an organisation. And what businesses are looking for is economic growth. You can have your businesses um, backed by venture capitalists. These are specialist companies that invest in businesses. And what businesses try to achieve is something known as an economy of scale. This is a trend for when the cost per unit reduces as the output increases. So if you, for example, were buying a multi-pack of something, you would expect the unit price to be cheaper than buying it individually. And that's what economies of scales does. You're only considered to be multinational corporation if you have facilities and assets in multiple countries. So it doesn't apply to businesses that just trade internationally. You physically have to have an office, a depot, some type of factory or something in another country to be classed as multinational. Um, and going back to the assets, assets naturally will depreciate over time. So when you first buy it, it might be worth, let's say, £10,000, but... Um, as time goes on, it depreciates. It can either fully depreciate and be worth nothing at the end or partially depreciate, which will allow you to sell it to, to return, get a return on some of your investment. And the whole point of having um, assets is to get some type of financial return. And finally, to grow market share. Okay, let's move on to 1.2 now. We're going to look at Porter's value chain model. So in 1985, Professor Michael Porter published his work on the value chain. This is now a widely accepted model of how organisations in the private sector earn profits and forms an important part of many corporate strategies. Here you can see there are a number of primary activities in an organisation, but these cannot function without the support activities such as procurement. And the role of procurement is to acquire all of the resources and other inputs that the organisation needs to carry out its primary activities. So the support activities at the top, you've got firm infrastructure like buildings, human resources management, that they will be responsible for making sure these primary activities have staff. Technology development, um, we can't do anything nowadays without computers, I guess. And of course, procurement. But let's go through these primary activities at the bottom. The inbound logistics are responsible for receiving, storing and distributing supplies internally. Procurement will help them to procure whatever those components and materials are. The operations conduct activities that turn inputs into goods and services that can be sold to our customers. And they may need machinery, equipment, storage, whatever it might be, that again, procurement have helped to buy. The outbound logistics is responsible for storing and distributing supplies externally towards the customer. And we'll have either procured the third party logistics contract or the vehicles that will be taking the goods out to our customers. In terms of sales and marketing, these are activities that find but also keep customers. So you might have a, um, a sales force that's out on the road 
driving nice cars with laptops and computers and mobile phones again we've probably procured all of those things on behalf of that activity and finally the after sales service is activities that maintain product after sales and also achieve customer care so again they're probably sitting in front of a computer with a telephone on a nice desk and chair again all the things that procurement would have helped them to buy so you can see how us as a support activity will help the primary activities to achieve their objectives but also if we can do this in the most cost effective way to reduce the cost of the inputs we can of course increase the margin or profit that an organization earns as a result and that's just a summary of what i've just said Okay, so we're going to move on now to um, a model called RACSI. So in the value chain model, operations is responsible for determining the future and current needs of our organisation. That's regarding the products and services it wants to offer to its customers. The procurement and supplier responsibilities need to know what to buy and where to buy it from. And one model for identifying business requirements is known as the RACSI model. Essentially, everything you buy should hit at least one of these um, reasons and if it doesn't then i'd ask yourself why are you buying it you know you really do need to be thinking about whether or not you're buying it because of a regulatory requirement so there could be things like fire extinguishers and first aid kits that is a legal requirement for us to buy you may be buying it for assurance of supply which is to ensure that you're going to get continued availability of the products or services you need or for a quality purpose, trying to aim for consistent, repeatable quality that's fit for purpose. It may be for a service factor, which are factors associated with the way products and services are supplied, like next day, or cost, because you're trying to meet a particular cost bracket, or a savings target of some description. Or finally, because there's new technology and innovation that's happened. So have a think about the things that you buy and ask yourself, why are you buying, buying them? And that will help you to understand the Raxi model. I am stepping through a kind of high level sourcing process here. So um, step one was really just looking at what we're buying, why we're buying it. And now what we're going to do is research. So market intelligence is about collecting bits of information from many sources, evaluating them to see how relevant they are to your supply market strategy, and then putting them together in a way that provides new insights into your supply markets and the way in which they work. And there are two ways in which you can collect market intelligence through desk research and field research. Desk research, as the name suggests, can be done from your desk. You're looking at information that's already been published, and that could be local business reference libraries, trade associations or publications, business magazines, or in the internet. The problem with desk research is it'll only go as far as information that's already been published. It doesn't necessarily answer your specific questions. And this is where field research comes in. This involves asking questions that are relevant which can either be qualitative or quantitative. So the quantitative stuff is statistics, it's numbers and facts and figures, whereas the qualitative research is people's opinions. You might be asking them, what do you think um, will happen in the future? What do you think the impact of this is going to be? It's subjective because it's, it's somebody's opinion, but nonetheless, it's interesting to see what people think, what people are thinking. Um, in another way that this is sometimes referred to is desk research is sometimes known as primary research and field research is sometimes known as secondary. Or it could be the other way around actually. Do check that. When you're doing field research, there are some tips for you to note. Try and avoid asking questions that elicit just a yes or a no answer. Instead, ask questions that begin with how, or explain, or why. Talk to the right people with the right experience, 
and enough people don't limit your um, market to two or three people because you'll only get a very limited response try not to ask leading questions as well and don't be selective in your research okay so now we looked at what we're buying why we're buying it and we've done some research next thing might be um, to do some spend analysis so to look internally at what you're buying so identifying what the item sorry what items the organization buys but also who you buy them from and who in your organization buys them so you could have multiple people within your business buying the same thing maybe different divisions or different offices so ask yourself what quantities are being bought and what prices are being paid it's possible that they're buying different i don't know brands makes models but it does the same job and they could all be paying different prices now the benefits of doing this is it will provide you with opportunities for savings because you may be able to consolidate or standardize your specification. It will also identify any non-compliance. So if, if your internal stakeholders are buying off contract when you have a corporate contract, you can see the leakage. And it will assist you in prioritizing preferred suppliers. You can then put them into um, the crowdject matrix or the supply positioning analysis as sometimes known. So the first step in deciding your sourcing strategy is to perform a supply positioning analysis. This is a buyer's perspective of the supply market and the suppliers and the products within it. It looks at two dimensions. Firstly, the importance or financial impact of what you're buying. And secondly, the complexity of the supply risk. The value of spend can be calculated using Pareto's principles, which I'll show you on the next slide. But it could be representative of how important the item is to your organisation. Which quadrant should buyers be focusing most of their time on? The strategic one, top right hand side. Strategic core is the portfolio in which items have major consequences for your company if they're not available when needed. So the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule. This was devised by um, somebody called Vilfredo Pareto. He was studying the wealth, um, I think it was in Italy. And what he discovered was 80% of the wealth was with 20% of the population. And then other people started to use this theory and say, well, OK, so this might apply to us. And I think in our industry, it would be 80 percent of spend is with 20 percent of your suppliers or 20 percent of what you sell equates to 80 percent of your turnover. And if you link this back to the supply position analysis we just looked at, your, most of your time needs to be spent in that top 80 percent. So it's all about what's important and what's not important. If you spend more of your time focusing on the 80% part, you'll get a better result for the company's bottom line. Now, to be successful, the sourcing strategy must easily communicate what the opportunity and the project is about. And one method for achieving this is known as the Situation Target Proposal, or the STP. Succinct and accurate statements that describe the situation, paints the vision of the target, and it lists the elements to be moved and used in moving from the current situation to the target. So there's an example on the screen that shows that a particular cost of a component is more than the budget that's available. So um, this, that's what the situation is. You've got 10 different suppliers that you're using, an average spend of 200,000, margin of 10, and you account for no more than 5% of their business. And the quality is not great. So the target, where do you want to get to? You want the same volume and quantity, but for 10% less with, and a better quality rating. So how are you gonna do it? And this is where the proposal kicks in. You need to produce a sourcing strategy that reduces the number of suppliers from that 10 down to a two maybe at the most, which will increase your value of your account with the supplier from that 5% which will then achieve better outcomes and improve, you can implement a quality improvement program as well. But it doesn't matter what you're doing when it comes to targets, you must ensure they're smart. 
So SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time bound. So to be specific, make the objective specific, explain exactly what you want to achieve and how it's to be done. In terms of measurable, make the objective measurable, ensure there is a way to check you have done what you set out to do in the first place. Achievable, make sure it's achievable. Objectives can be challenging, but make sure the outcome can happen. In terms of relevant, the objective has to tie in with the goals of the organisation. And time bound, make the objective time bound. Set deadlines to work towards to complete the activity as planned. And the final bit on our sourcing process is just to think about the contract management life cycle. Um, and you need to do this up front in order for the contract to work properly at the end. But once you have your contract in place, your organisation will be using it. You need to make sure that the delivery of the goods and services complies with the terms of the contract. And this is what we call contract management. There are four main stages. The first one is to make sure the contract is clear on its allocation of risk, the level of and quality of service required and how value for money is delivered. This is in your contract design. You then move on to looking at roles and responsibilities, governance, risk management plans, change control, business continuity plans for force majeure events, issues management and dispute procedures. And this is at stage two, contract administration. Stage three sets out all the activities that monitors and reports whether the supplier is delivering the products or services to the terms stipulated in the contract. And this is known as contract performance. We'll often look at KPIs, for example, here. And the final stage is a set of activities that take place when the contract ends or is about to end, such as renewals, transitions, lessons learned and supply relationships. This is stage four, contract completion. We're now going to look at public sector. So public sector organisations are owned and run by the government and they provide essential services such as education, law enforcement, healthcare, social services, transport and waste. And they're funded through taxation. We pay tax in a number of ways. Income tax, VAT, and tax on fuel. There's lots of taxes that we pay. But the primary objective of a public sector organisation is to deliver essential services and accessibility in, and it's an important performance measure for the government. Government have several branches. So you can either be um, central government, which sets minimum standards across services offered to the public, and that's essentially um, across the entire country. Local government interacts with the general public in order to meet specific needs and it receives its funding from central government and local taxes. So your local government and the decisions they make will only affect the area in which you live rather than the entire country. Non-ministerial departments are headed up by civil servants, not ministers. And then you've got your public enterprises who deliver public programmes, goods and services. So I'm going to give you some examples of each. So from central government, we've got people like the Ministry of Defence, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs and Treasury. Local government, will you be a local council or your health service? Non-ministerial departments are companies like Ofsted and Ofwat and the pensions regulators. And the only public enterprise I can think of in the UK is the BBC, the British Broadcasting Consortium. We pay a TV licence to use the BBC. Um, which is why there are no television or commercial adverts. Now, in terms of procurement in the public sector, it's largely the same as in the private sector. They do all the sourcing activities that, you know, I, I spoke through when we were looking at private sector. So they go out, generate options for meeting the demand now and in the future. They'll do the procurement, the acts of engaging with the markets to source the providers, let contracts and agree the options. But the interesting thing public sector do that the others don't is commissioning. And these are activities that generate demand for the services. I'm going to show you a diagram that shows you the differences between commissioning and procurement. So procurement is in the middle. 
you can see um, the sorts of things you'd expect like um, assessing the needs, analysing suppliers, developing specs, contract management, reviewing outcomes, all those sorts of things you'd expect to see. But on the outer ring, you can see this plan, do, review, analyse. I guess what they're doing is um, a needs of the population assessment and looking at what's legislative, you know, what do we have to do versus what, what would be sort of discretionary, be nice to do. And then they move into that sort of gap analysis. They think, right, okay, so what is it that our stakeholders actually need us to do? Um, <clears throat> and they'll design services that will meet the needs of their, um, their stakeholders. And then they work with the market. So a lot of the market that serve the sort of, I guess, the social care sector, which is where commissioning mainly sits, could be a mixture of sort of voluntary organisations as well as, you know, private sector organisations. Sometimes it's statutory partners as well, but they'll work with the suppliers and develop them and build capacity and manage the relationships. So quite a little bit different, you know, they're very much um, dealing with the, the, the front line and looking at what the customer wants. I suppose it's the equivalent of having a sales function or a marketing function in the public sector, which you wouldn't ordinarily have because you don't sell, sell anything, do you? You just provide services. So that's commissioning. And in terms of the service delivery, um, it's driven by four aspects, the relationship, the sector, the funding and the vehicle, the supply vehicle, I mean, not physical vehicles. So in terms of the relationship, it'll either be done in-house, some sort of joint delivery between a private and public sector organisation, or it could be completely external. And the sectors can either come from the public or the private. Statutory partners like the NHS would be a statutory partner to local councils on certain things or the voluntary sector, and I'm going to talk about the third sector in a moment. Funding can either be paid for or grant funded. So there are certain services like Meals on Wheels that we would provide in a government context, but the receiver of the meals would pay for it. And in terms of the supply vehicle, as I said, I'll talk about the third sector in a moment, but you've got charities, other not-for-profits or social enterprises. Now, um, additional burden that the public sector have when they're running tenders is that they are um, governed currently, certainly in the UK, by the EU procurement regulations. So once commissioners decided on the service needed, it has to be procured. And currently that is under the public procurement EU regulations. This, these were recorded before um, the UK left the European Union. Um, so. In terms of the purpose of it, I guess the purpose is to ensure that any public procurement is maintained in a fair, transparent and open way and that everything we do is ethically compliant. And these regulations kick in at a certain value threshold. Currently, it's around £180,000 for goods and services and about £4.7 million for works. But those thresholds are reviewed every two years. So do check if you are looking at it um, after this recording has been published. So there are five types of processes used in tendering. The first is known as an open procedure, which is a one stage approach. It's used in markets with a small number of suppliers. So you publish it on a portal which is accessible to other suppliers. Um, anybody that sees it can apply. So if you do have a large market, it's not advisable to go open because you will spend weeks on end evaluating responses. The restricted, res restricted procedure kind of helps with that. If you do have a large market, then it's a two-staged approach rather than a one-stage. Um, the first stage is a pre-qualification, which um, allows you to shortlist down to a manageable number at stage two to be invited to tender. So you would use a PQQ essentially, which stands for a pre-qualification questionnaire. The last three aren't used very often. I'll briefly tell you about them. You've got competitive dialogue procedure, which engages the market when you're attempting to clarify the best way to meet the requirements. So you can only use it in certain circumstances. You'd be saying to a supplier, I need a particular outcome, but I don't know how to do it. And you're letting the suppliers dialogue with you during the process to tell you how. 
Um, competitive procedure with negotiation, sometimes known as CPN, is used when it's not possible to buy a standard off the shelf solution. So you might look at say a, to, some software packages where no two of them are the same. You may decide to stipulate a, a, a list of mandatory must-haves with um, a list of nice-to-haves and you might be able to negotiate on the nice-to-haves so long as everybody in the um, in the competition can meet the, the mandatory requirements. And the innovation partnership, I've not, I don't know anyone that's used it so far, but um, this is used when the product or service you require is not currently available on the market. So it gives you an opportunity to sort of stimulate the market and ask, ask for the market to start serving you with a product that they don't currently serve. And I guess the final slide on public sector is it will come to no surprise that public bodies have to make budget savings. And that's because people are living longer, the population is growing and they have less money to serve more people. So the concept known as the three E's stands for economy, efficiency and effectiveness, which are three words that sound very similar. So what's the difference? So savings that government can make can be economy savings, first and foremost. This is about saving money paying the same for less, getting the same for less. They're cashable savings. This money can then be spent elsewhere. The second one is efficiency. Unlike economy, which is about saving money, this one is about saving time. So it's about reducing inputs, but maintaining the outputs or maximizing outputs for the same inputs. And therefore it's a non-cashable saving. And effectiveness is essentially the relationship between the actual and intended impact of a service. We're now going to look at the not-for-profit or third sector. So not-for-profit or third can be used interchangeably and their primary objective is to create social wealth. It's funded mainly through voluntary contributions and donations. But these organisations can also receive grant funding and generate revenue through retail activities. So let's go through the examples on the screen. Social enterprises are set up by social, for social, environmental or cultural objectives. So it could be, for example, counselling children with mental health issues. Mutuals are privately owned companies that are owned by their employees who contribute money as share capital and are therefore entitled to receive profit share. So in the UK, the John Lewis partnership and Waitrose are a mutual. Cooperatives are similar to mutuals, but the staff don't have to contribute money. Um, and they essentially share, share their surplus with uh, their members, which could include farmers, and they've got a really big fair trade following. We've got charities. Charities are set up to help those in need. So you can think of some examples like Oxfam and uh, uh, shelter homeless charities. Housing associations. They're private, but they're non-profit making, designed to provide affordable housing to the public. Any surplus that uh, a housing association makes goes back to serving the home. So they'll, I don't know, they'll improve the roofs, the windows, the doors, whatever. There are voluntary groups that are delivered by volunteers and some self-help groups as well and community organisations like church, church run scouts and brownies and, and things like that. Now, clearly, money is being donated to these organisations, so there is an element of accountability they have to make sure that the money is being spent the way it was intended. Um, accountability in the third sector has four components. Firstly, transparency is information must be accessible for public scrutiny. There's an answerability, compliance to monitoring procedures, and finally, enforcement, which is sanctions for shortfalls in compliance. So one thing that you can do to try and um, ensure that you remain accountable in the third sector is to develop something known as a RACI matrix. RACI stands for responsible, accountable, consulted and informed. So when you have a list of tasks, like an example I've put on the screen there, um, you can literally list every task down and identify who is responsible who is accountable, 
who needs to be consulted and who needs to be informed of every single task that you do. So in terms of their accountability, um, it's quite complicated due to the range of people and groups who have an interest in what they do. So firstly, upward accountability is being accountable to the people who fund the services. Then client accountability for people who receive the services. Internal accountability is to people within the organisation who want to demonstrate that they're delivering upon their mission. So I can give you an example where this um, went wrong for a company called Oxfam um, a few years ago. They bought some wristbands that had uh, make poverty history written on them. It was very well intentions in terms of trying to generate revenue to serve their, serve their beneficiaries. But they didn't vet their supply chain properly and many months later it transpired that these wristbands were being made by children which goes against everything they stand for. So that internal accountability is quite important. So in terms of the differences, um, clearly public, private and third all have different purposes. We've got public sector essential services, private sector for profit, third sector for social wealth. In terms of sizes, they can be as small as a micro sole trader or partnership, all the way up to a large multinational incorporated organisation. There are heavier regulations and transparency requirements for the public and third sector than there is in the private. And I guess the only private sector one to consider is the additional stuff that an incorporated company has to publish on an annual basis. But our role in procurement, regardless of these sectors, is to achieve value for money, use specifications to detail requirements and use quotes and tenders to identify the best supplier. Thank you for watching.